This morning's teaching is titled, The Woman at the Well. You know, to me, the Bible is a mystery uh, a bit in the way it was written. We think of the Bible as our manual or our handbook for life, and yet it's not written like a scientific or even a theology textbook. Theology is the science of God, and it's, it's just not written as a textbook. Textbooks spend most of their time describing concepts and theories and um, you know, I have two degrees from Texas A&M uh, University. As you all know, I'm a rocket scientist. And, um, and I've, I've studied a lot of complicated textbooks in my life. My physics textbooks described electricity and magnetism and how that relates to an electric motor and how an electric motor might work. But you know what? The physics textbooks never told me how to make an electric motor. Nor did they tell me the history of electricity. You know how uh, Westinghouse and Edison fought over whether it ought to be DC or AC and those kinds of things. Uh, we get used to the precision and the completeness of textbooks. A textbook clearly describes every term it's going to use and then it rigorously sticks with that term throughout the entire textbook. But, a, but the Bible sometimes will use a word in one way, and then in another place it'll use that same word in a different way. I tried to do a study on the mind, soul, and spirit one time, and I just got frustrated and gave up because there were too many times that each of those words were used in different ways. It wasn't like a rigorous scientific textbook. You know, we look at the Bible, and sometimes it seems vague or ambiguous. Uh, like, for instance, the Bible story about Rahab. Uh, she's the one that uh, saves the Israeli spies, right? And um, in the New Testament, we read about how she's part of the Hall of Faith. She's a great hero. But wait a minute, wasn't she a prostitute? <laughs> Didn't she lie so that those spies would be protected? And there's no mention of her breaking at least two commandments. <laughs> What's up with that? There's just a tension in the Bible between theory and practical application. And sometimes we're supposed to deduce the theory from the story. And sometimes, especially in some of the stuff that Paul wrote, um, you know, it's just the opposite. We're supposed to take the theories and then figure out how to make practical application of those. People who try to turn the Bible into a scientific textbook, I think they're making an incorrect assumption about the Bible. The Bible is given to us not to teach us concepts about nature and science, okay? But it's primarily to help us in two areas of relationship. Our relationship with God and our relationship with our fellow man. Don't try to turn the Bible into a scientific textbook. It wasn't given to us for that purpose. We humans learn best by example, not by theory. Uh, give a 10-year-old a cookbook <clears throat> and tell them to make several different meals and who knows what you're going to get from their cooking, right? But take three of those recipes and cook them with that child. Uh, let them learn how to measure, how to pour, how to stir. Explain what the, te what the cookbook means with some of the th things it says. And even their first try at a meal will turn out pretty good. And from then on, they'll be able to teach themselves how to use that cookbook. We learn by example better than we learn by theory. And so the Bible is mostly examples. It's mostly narratives and stories. This is how our children learn about the world. Not what we tell them about how to act, but how we act. That's why... A child who has, was abused as a child will probably grow up to be an abuser as an adult because that's what they learned from what they saw. So the Bible is full of examples, what to do, what not to do. But the Bible 
doesn't have a whole lot of this concept of theory in it. I mean, it's got some theory sections like Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, Proverbs, uh, Paul's epistles. Um, but mostly, its primary job is to just tell us stories and then let us interpret those stories. Let us deduce the concepts and the principles that we get out of those stories. And so this also leaves certain details of interpretation of the story up to the individual or to the community of believers who's reading it. Who, you know, the, the point is that there's not just one interpretation of the story. For instance, we here in the West might get one interpretation out of this story of the woman at the well, but somebody in communist China might get a whole different interpretation out of this. And that's okay. That's how God intended this to be. It's not supposed to be some uh, rigid textbook. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look into a story in a flexible way. We're going to try to interpret it and see what we can get out of this story that makes sense in our lives. And it's the story of the woman at the well. You'll find that in the Gospel of John chapter 4. It's most of that chapter starts in verse 3 and goes all the way to verse 42. <clears throat> We're not going to read all of that right now. We'll kind of read it as we go. But I want to start by kind of setting some groundwork where this story occurred, happened in Samaria. Samaria is this region between Galilee in the north and Jerusalem in the south. And Samaria is right there in the middle. Turn to 1 Kings, uh, 1 Kings 16, verse, start in verse 24. We're going to read 16, 24 through 28. 1 Kings 16, 24 says... He bought the hill Samaria from Shemar for two talents of silver, and he built on the hill the city there was named Samaria after the name of Shemar, the owner of the hill. Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord. This is the guy that bought the hill, and he acted more wickedly than all who had been before him. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and he also, in, in his sins, which he made Israel sin, he provoked the Lord God of Israel with their idols. Now the rest of the acts of Omri, which he did, and his might, which he showed, are they not written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Omri slept with his fathers and bar was buried in Samaria, and Ahab, his son, became king in his place. This is is the area of some of the evil kings, especially King Ahab, Samaria. Remember, Israel as a nation was split in two. The tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin became what was known as Judea in the southern part around Jerusalem. And then Israel, the rest of the tribes, were known as the northern tribes uh, and known as Israel. And those were the more evil folks uh, in the north there around Samaria. A rift arose between the good and pure Jews that were in Judea and the bad Jews who were in the north in Samaria. And these Samaritan Jews, uh, they had intermarried with non-Jews against the law. They had mixed their religion with local pagan customs. Sometimes they followed a little bit of Torah, the law of, of Moses. Sometimes they didn't. Uh, and they just, uh, they did idol worship. They were not going the right direction. And one of the areas of contention with the, Samar the Judeans and the Israel Israelis was, where do we worship? The Jews in Judea said, well, our primary worship has to be done in Jerusalem because that's what Torah says. That's what the Bible says, and that gives us some validity to our claims. And in making this claim, uh, the Judeans then wouldn't let the northern tribes come and worship in Judea I mean, yeah, in Jerusalem, because the northern tribes, their worship wasn't pure. It wasn't true. It was corrupted. Uh, you'll see about this later in the story. 
uh, the Samaritan said, it didn't make any difference where you worship. Well, of course they're going to say that because they're not following the law. And so they're going to kind of say, well, whatever we want to do, it's okay for us to do. Uh, they were arrogant about this. And they'd rather not worship God at all than to properly to humble themselves and properly worship God in Israel. They just wouldn't admit that they were wrong and they wouldn't go worship in Jerusalem uh, the way God had told them to worship in the first place. And so there's just this big split. Turn to 2 Kings. 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings 17, starting in verse 32. 2 Kings 17, 32 reads, They also feared the Lord and appointed from among themselves priests of the high places who acted for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and they served their gods according to the custom of the nations from among whom they had been carried away into exile. This is talking about the ten northern tribes. They, the Samaritans worshipped God some and then they worshipped idols right along with that. So the Samaritans were really Jews too, but they weren't really pure Jews. And the purebred Jews really look down their noses at these mixed breeds. I mean, after all, we're the good ones. Uh, we're the ones who God really loves because we serve God correctly. And when it came to Jews and Samaritans, uh, there was a lot of racism on both sides. This is why when Jesus told the parable, uh, who is your neighbor? We call that the parable of the good Samaritan. <laughs> he used the Samaritan as the hero of the story so he could kind of poke in the eye some of these folks who were being racist about Samaritans. You know, this is another example of the Bible teaching through stories. You listen to the story and then it's up to you to gain from that story whatever it is that God has for you in your life. And hopefully those people understood maybe the racism we have against the Samaritans is not such a good thing. I don't know. But anyway, this is the backdrop of the story. So we're going to pick up the story in John chapter 4, the Gospel of John chapter 4. And we're going to start with verses 3 through 7 where Jesus goes to the well of Jacob at noontime. John 4 and 3. He left Judea, went away again into, Jer into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. To me, this whole story of the woman at the well is really about Jesus doing inner healing and then watching the results of what I call miracle evangelism. And you're going to see more about that as uh, we go through this story. Uh, there's just a lot to this story. Let's dive into it. So in verses 3 and 4 here of John 4, we see that Jesus goes to Galilee and uh, he's, he's in Judea south. And so he's going to go up to Galilee near where his home was. Uh, and that was in the north. And that was about a 70 mile trip. And so by foot, that was several days for him and his disciples to trek up there. And any respectable Jew would have navigated around, Jeru um, around uh, Samaria. Uh, they would have set their GPS to avoid Samaria. You know, like we do avoid tolls and avoid highways, right? But Jesus didn't do that. Verse 4 says that Jesus had to pass through Samaria. But if you look at a map, we can see that it would have been real easy for him to just gone east a little bit, cross the Jordan, and then go up to Galilee that way. So here's one of those places where the interpretation is left up to us. Why did Jesus have to go through Samaria? 
Well, an industrial engineer, uh, you know, somebody that looks at how efficient things are and wants to make things as efficient as possible, he would look at it and say, well, Jesus had to go through Samaria because that was the most direct route. But you know what? I see this differently. Personally, I think Jesus had to go through Samaria because the Holy Spirit compelled him. The Holy Spirit had a mission for Jesus, and that mission was at Jacob's well, just outside the town of Sychar in the evil land of Samaria. What do you think? So anyway, Jesus shows up at this well. It's about noontime. It says the sixth hour. And we pick up in verse 5. He came to this place. It was at Jacob's well there. It was about the sixth hour. And again, we're kind of left to, um, to interpret some of this for ourselves. This woman comes out to the well, Jacob's well, about noontime. Well, you know, we can read from historical, doc historical documents of this um, era and this area that women didn't draw wells, water, uh, at noontime. They drew it in the morning. And oh, by the way, they also drew it at the closest well to their house. That makes sense, right? In this case, Sychar actually had a well. There was a source of water that this woman could have drawn from, but she didn't. She went out of town. She went at a time. No women were drawing water. And that's where she's showing up uh, with Jesus. Why was she doing that? Was it maybe to avoid the catty village women, you know, who shunned her? Was it because her reputation was so bad that she didn't want to be around her neighbors? We don't know. Others may have looked down on her, but Jesus didn't. Others might have felt like that they were more righteous than she was, but Jesus knew they were all sinners in the need of a Savior. We're all sick. We need a doctor, and as long as we live on this earth, we will never get completely well. We'll never become completely immune to the virus of sin. Turn to Romans 5 with me. Romans 5, verses 6 through 10. I think this informs us of Jesus' attitude. Romans 5 and 6 says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone might even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. How much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Then much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved in his life. While we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. Paul here explains this theory behind Jesus' attitude and his actions. Jesus didn't see any difference between the Samaritans, the Jews, the Gentiles. He loved them all. He wasn't angry with the Samaritan woman. He's not angry with you, okay? The next time you look down on somebody, remember this scene. And let me tell you a couple of rotten attitudes out of my life and see if maybe you can identify with these things. When you catch yourself saying something like, why are they wearing those old clothes? Don't they have anything better to wear? Maybe the Lord will be saying, no, they don't have anything better. But I love them just as I love you. Actually, I've heard the Lord in a situation like this say, uh, they wish they had nice clothes like you do. Boy, talk about putting you in your place. Or how about an attitude like this? Well, no wonder they're stuck on the side of the road, broke down, that old clunker they're driving. Why don't they have a good, reliable car like I have? And then if you say something like that in your heart, maybe you'll hear the Lord say something like, poor thing, that's the best they can afford. And then, then the Lord might say something like, remember when all you had was a junker to drive? Now let's go back to John 4. Still talking about Jesus' attitude here toward this woman. John 4, 27. Uh, this is later in the story where the disciples come back 
And uh, they're amazed that Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. But nobody said, what do, what do you seek and why do you speak with her? You know, the disciples, they had, hadn't been around Jesus long enough to understand what was really going on in his heart. They didn't understand his love and his compassion that he has for everybody. John three sixteen and 17 says that he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but he came so that everybody could call on him and be saved. What a beautiful picture we have here in the story of the woman in the well to learn about how to love others and how to look over others and their... I don't know, what would you call it? Their uh, frailties, their failures, whatever. Well, let's continue on in John 4. Let's see. We were in, we stopped at verse 7. Let's pick up verse 7 again uh, and go 7 through 9. So what happens is Jesus is drawing this woman into a discussion and he wants to draw her into a discussion about eternal things. There came a woman from Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Uh, his disciples had gone away in the city to buy food. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to Jesus, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews had no dealing with Samaritans. <laughs> the scripture wants to make clear this uh, historical situation they were in about the racism between the two groups. You know, she's going like, uh, you're trying to try strike up a conversation with me. What's going on here? Uh, Jews don't talk to us. How did she know he was a Jew? Uh, maybe it was, was his clothing, maybe his accent, his dialect. I don't know. Let's continue reading verse 10 through 12. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. I don't know why Jesus is using third person here, but he does. And she says, uh, Sir, you don't have anything to draw with from the well. And the well's deep. How in the world are you going to get some of this living water? <laughs> you are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? He's the one who gave us this well, and he drank from it himself, him and his cattle. So Jesus gives her a hint about wanting to have a spiritual discussion with her. But this woman just doesn't get it. You know, whoosh, just goes right over her head, right? Um, how could you be greater than Jacob, she asks. Well, let's see, verses 13 through 15. Jesus answered her and said, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him... They will never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said, ah, sir, give me this water so I'll not be thirsty and I won't have to come here to draw water. <laughs> Jesus tells her about living water, but she still doesn't understand. You know, we know in our homes... Um, what it's like to have living water, right? <laughs> you just go up to the kitchen faucet and turn the faucet on and ta -da, you get water. You don't have to go draw a well or eat the water from a well and carry it home or anything like that. Uh, but I don't think that's what Jesus was talking about here. What do you think Jesus meant by living water? Let's see if we can find a scripture like in John 7 that'll help us understand what he was talking about. John 7 Verses 37 through 39 is another place where Jesus talks about living water. John 7, 37. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and he cried out saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Okay. Okay. Well, we see he's, Jesus is talking about this living water. But look at verse 39. It says, but this he spoke 
of the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Oh, this living water Jesus is talking about is the gift of the Holy Spirit living in us. Oh, so Jesus wasn't really talking about being saved. He was talking about a day when people could get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this is us he's talking about, right? That we have these rivers of living water flowing out of us, out of our innermost being. Uh, how important is it for us to open up and let the Holy Spirit flow through us like a river? Uh, not only giving us living water, but pouring out living water on everyone that's around us. Uh, yes, I know you have to be saved first before you can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. But listen to Jesus' heart. He's looking forward to a time when there are going to be millions of believers all filled with that Holy Spirit, all wild-eyed radicals for Jesus, just looking for somebody that they can pour out this living water onto. You know, looking for somebody that they can, that needs a miracle, somebody that they can let the Holy Spirit flow through them and touch that person that needs that miracle. This is exactly what Jesus did with this woman. She needed a miracle of inner healing in her life. And Jesus was bringing, a, bringing her to a place where she could receive that. So let's go on back to John 4. John 4, 16 through 19. John 4, 16. She says, uh, you know, yeah, sure, give me some of this so I don't have to draw again. And Jesus says, go call your husband and come back. And the woman answered and said, well, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have, have had five husbands and the one whom you have now is not your husband. In this you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. This is when Jesus actually begins to minister to this woman. And I think there are two concepts at work in this part of the story. One is attesting miracles and the other is inner healing. And I want to talk about both of those. We will get to inner healing next time. Today we're going to at least start talking about this concept of attesting miracles. Uh, look at, in verse 16 and uh, through 18 here. This is Jesus giving her a word of knowledge. And he revealed to this woman something that in the natural, there was just no way that he could know about her. This was a miracle. It was a wonder. Sometimes we call these things signs and wonders. Uh, why do we call them signs? Well, this is the concept of an attesting miracle. The idea that God works a miracle through someone that attests to or confirms that they are sent by God to do some kind of, of ministry. A miracle attests to God working in and through that person at whose hands the miracle occurred. The person didn't do the miracle, God did the miracle, but because God did the miracle through that person, then that must mean that God is somehow working in, with, through them, whatever you want to call it. I mean, sometimes we think that people uh, are looking for a sign from God that there's somehow something wrong with that. Oh, no, you shouldn't seek the sign. But you know what? The exact opposite is true. God loves to show his love and his heart through miracles, through signs and wonders. He loves to confirm somebody's ministry through miracles that flow through them. Uh, let me show you some scriptures about that. I'm going to show you one today, and then next time we're going to look at two or three others that prove this concept. John 3, John 3 and verse 2. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the middle of the night, right? And he says, Rabbi, we know that you come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do 
unless God is with him. Nicodemus knows that Jesus is Messiah because of the miracles that he's done. This idea of attesting miracles uh, actually brings people to a place where they can receive Jesus. Um, let me tell you a story about this. kind of fits with the woman at the well. Uh, me and two other fellows recently went to Walmart. We were just looking for somebody to pray for. And uh, we saw this guy, and the Lord began to speak to us about him. So we went up to him, and one of us said, uh, your, your back is hurting. And the other said, you've got a headache. <laughs> when we did that, this guy backed up about two steps. His eyes got real big. Mouth fell open. What are y'all, some kind of psychics or something? <laughs> no, no, man. We're just here uh, to pray for folks because we want to let you know that Jesus loves you. And one of the ways he'll let you know that is by showing you things about what's going on in your life. Well, my back's really hurting and my head's really hurting. And so we prayed for this guy. Now, we prayed for him two or three different times before he was completely pain-free. But once he was pain-free, guess what? He was open to receiving Jesus. Jesus as Savior. And we prayed the sinner's prayer with this man. This is what I call miracle evangelism. And it's because of an attesting miracle. This is exactly what's going to be happening as we see in the story of the woman at the well. And we will pick up on that idea next week and talk more about attesting miracles. We'll talk about inner healing. We'll talk about all kinds of other things that are in this great story.